Now, I don't know if you knew that or not, but Splash Kingdom is coming tonight. So I hope that you have plans to be there. But we are excited to have you here this morning. If you are a visitor, uh, welcome. Uh, we want to get your information so we can say thank you for being here today. And here's how we do it. If you go to our website at fbcedom.com, you'll see that yellow, little yellow box right there. It says, click here to connect with us. As soon as you pull up our website, all you have to do is put in your information. That way we can know that you are here today. If you are here today and you are a visitor, whether this is your first time or your fifth time, we don't really care. We do want to give you Splash Kingdom tickets. Uh, we want you to join us tonight. We'll be there from 6.30 to 8.30. We have rented out uh, the water park just for our church and our friends. Uh, and so we want you to be a part of that. So I encourage you, um, let us know. See me after the service, and I'll make sure uh, that you can be there with us tonight. And that way we can all go and have a good time together. It's going to be a great time. And I hope that you'll be there. Uh, but listen, this morning's going to be a great time as well as we get into the Word. I'm excited to be able to do that. Uh, but today's even a, a special day, not just because Splash Kingdom, uh, but because it's an anniversary day. In fact, today, actually tomorrow, August the 3rd, marks two years uh, that Scott Maddox has been here and has been a worship pastor. Give a round of applause. We are very, very thankful to the ministry of Scott. He's done a lot uh, as far as our worship goes. He does a great job leading us every Sunday. And, and when he doesn't, if he messes up, he's always got Colleen. We're so thankful for Colleen, too. I, I mentioned this in the first service. But listen. When, you know, when, when it comes to ministry, you'll hear people say a lot of times, oh, well, my, my wife was called to ministry or my husband was called to ministry. I wasn't called to that. The Bible tells us that we're all one. We're one in Christ. So it would be impossible for God to call a separate person. If you are one in Christ, he calls both of you. That's the, that, the Bible says you are one. And so when I look at that and I think about Colleen and Scott, they, they, they do such a great job together. She is always there to support him. And hold him accountable when he misses a string or two right there. <laughs> but just, we are so thankful for both Colleen and Scott. And for your faithfulness, we have a little gift for you there. This one's actually got something in it. So yeah, uh, early, if you remember, this is the second time I've done this. Uh, so earlier I had to give an empty one. That one's like, don't throw that one away. Okay. There's actually something in that one. So but we appreciate Scott and his ministry. Uh, and we are thankful for both him and Colleen. I'm going to ask Sean to come up and open us up in a word of prayer. Well, awesome. Um, before we pray, I just wanted to say we had our lifted summer camp 2020. Um, First Baptist Church van and First Baptist Church Edom came together, and God did an awesome thing. Seventy students um, were brought under the teaching of God's Word, had a lot of fun, um, and definitely and one thing I would encourage the students in is the altar was always open, right? The altar's always open, and I think sometimes, specifically Baptists, Sometimes they go, there has to be an altar of call. But I want to encourage you that the altar is always open. Jesus tore the veil that you can lay down your sin from this past week that's laying on your conscience so that he can remind you of his faithfulness and you can walk in his goodness. Amen? Amen. So let us pray. Jesus, thank you so much for this morning. Lord, thank you so much for your goodness and your faithfulness towards us. As your scripture says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And Lord, I pray your Holy Spirit in this moment would draw us to our knees. Lord, remind us of your grace, Lord. And as we respond, we respond in spirit and in truth to who you are. Lord, you are so good. We love you and we pray these things in Jesus' name.
Yeah. 
John chapter 3, verse 22 through 36, and it is this interaction that John the Baptist has with his disciples. Inside this text, we have in John, in John chapter 3, verse 30, we have that famous quote from John the Baptist that he says, he must increase and I must decrease. And so over the next three weeks, we're just going to sort of look at that text and, and look at what John was saying when he said that. And we're going to look at the lesson and how it applies to our life. When you look at John 3, chapter 3, and you think about John chapter 3, most people immediately talk about John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever would believe in him wouldn't perish but have everlasting life. You hear John chapter 3, that's the first thing that usually will pop into somebody's mind. Well, John chapter 3 is, man, such a great, great book or chapter of teaching. When you look at it, it starts out with Jesus and this Pharisee, Nicodemus. And it's in that conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus that we get John 3.16. But really what Jesus is doing is he is teaching Nicodemus what it means to be born again. We hear that word and, you know, it might even be labeled as, you know, evangelical or Christian. That's, a, that's one of Christian terms, born again. No, that's a Jesus term. Jesus used that terminology when he was talking to Nicodemus, explaining the process of becoming a Jesus follower. He was explaining the process of how you get eternal life. He told Nicodemus that you must be born again. So in John chapter 3, the first half of it is Jesus in teaching Nicodemus. Well, the second part of John chapter 3 is John the Baptist teaching. And that's where we're at today. John the Baptist is going to be with his disciples. And they come to him with some discouraging news so they thought but John the Baptist is quickly going to let them know that that news is not discouraging but this is news of great joy this is this is news that they should rejoice over when you think about us as Christians one of the things that we always think about is that we are the light of the world and so that the, 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 Jesus tells us in Matthew that we are the light of the world Matthew chapter 5 he tells us that we are the light of the world we are the salt of the earth and so when we think about that, we become these believers in Christ and we have this light within us that it's our job to shine that light. But so many times what ends up happening is we want the light to shine on us and not on Jesus. How many times have you ever had a super bright light shine directly in your face? When you think about that, if somebody came in here with one of these brand new, powerful LED flashlight spotlights, and they shine it directly in your face, you wouldn't be able to see anything else. Now, somebody might say, oh, that's blinding. I, you know, I'm blinded by that light. Well, you're not really blind. All you see is that light is so bright. The only thing that you see is that light. But the truth is that light is supposed to be illuminating things around it. See, as believers, we're the light to the world. Our job is to illuminate the love of Jesus. 
We're supposed to show people who Jesus is, what Jesus has done for them. When we become the focus of people and we want the light on us, that light takes away from who Jesus is. This is what John begins to explain to his followers in John chapter 3, 22 through 36. So follow along with me. Grab your Bible. If you uh, like to follow along and use our app, and don't forget, you can go to events. You can open up the notes in the app, and you can follow along. If you don't have our church app, I encourage you, you can go to our website and find instructions how to download it. It's not as easy as just putting in First Baptist Edom and poop, we pop up. There's specific instructions, but if you go to our website and you go to the Connect page, it can, it can explain all that to you so that you can download our app and have access to it. But John chapter 3 is where we're going to be as we start to look at this interaction between John and his disciples. Verse 22, after these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judah, and there he was spending time. With them and baptizing. Verse 23 John also was baptizing in Anon near Salem because there was much water there and people were coming and were being baptized. For John had not yet been thrown into prison. So we're going to stop there just so, just so you can sort of know what's going on. Basically, right now, after these things, it was after that interaction that Jesus had with Nicodemus. They move on. They move down to this specific area in Judah, and it was actually Anon. And so this is where they're at. And Jesus and his disciples are there, and many people are being baptized. Well, John the Baptist and his disciples are sort of on the other side of town. Not really even the other side of town. They're really over in sort of even a different county. And they are there, and they're doing the same type of thing, same thing, baptizing people, calling them to repentance because the kingdom of God is at hand. And then in verse 25, you have John and his disciples. They're ministering like they normally would. And the scriptures tells us, therefore, there arose a discussion. Now, a lot of times when you hear that, there arose a discussion. It might as well mean that here comes the debate or here comes the argument. And that's what starts to happen. Apparently, John, his disciples, they're in this area. They're baptizing people. A Jewish leader comes up, and he begins to question them on the law of purification. This wasn't uncommon. They tried to do the same thing to Jesus because they're baptizing people for the repentance of sin, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And they are questioning them on their purification. And so what you see is, therefore, arose a discussion on the part of John's disciples with the Jew about purification. What, I, what probably took place was as they got into this discussion and they were talking about the baptism that John was performing, they also probably mentioned about Jesus. And they said, yeah, well, this Jesus and his disciples, now you have to understand, I'm just sort of trying to look in the text here, that this Jesus and his disciples... They're over there on the other side of the county, and they're baptizing people too, just like y'all are. The only difference is they're over there baptizing people, and they got way more people than you do. There's more people going over there to the Jesus camp than there is the John camp. What do you think about that? Well, that remark really disturbed John's disciples. So when you look at verse 26 and it says, And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. So they're like, whoa, John, did you hear? I mean, we're over here. We're talking to this guy. He's challenges about the purification laws. And as he's doing this, then he lets us know about Jesus and what Jesus and his disciples are doing just a few towns over. And that they've actually got more people coming to them. And people are going there instead of to us to be baptized. This doesn't sound right, Jesus. What's, I mean, this doesn't sound right, John. What, what's going on here? And so you have this interaction where they're actually frustrated because people are going to Jesus. Isn't that strange? They're frustrated because Jesus and his disciples, they have, they are, their following is larger now 
than the following of John and his disciples. And John, in this moment, realized, wait a second, we got to fix this. This isn't right. You've got the wrong attitude. You're looking at this totally wrong. And so I need to have a conversation with you guys. You just sit down for a second because I've got something to say. And then in verse 27 it says, And John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves are my witnesses that I said I am not the Christ, but I have been sent ahead of him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands, hears him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice, so that this joy of mine has been made full. He must increase, but I must decrease. There it is. That's where it's coming from. He must increase, and I must decrease. He says that. In total understanding of the process that's taking place right there in front of them. That Christ is increasing as their ministry decreases. And when you think about the ministry of John the Baptist, it's about to decrease tragically. Because he is going to lose his life. His head will be cut off because he is proclaiming that who Jesus is. And ultimately he's going to lose his life. And so the, the ministry of Jesus begins to grow and he begins to try to explain to his disciples that, hey, you don't, you don't get it. You don't, you're not even getting and understanding our whole purpose. So this morning, I just want to take a quick look as we start this sort of new series and this new look at John chapter 3 right here and this interaction with John the Baptist and his disciples. I want us to just look and learn, see what we can learn from this interaction between John and his disciples. The first thing that I think John is pointing out to them, the very first thing is, don't make this about us. I mean, how many times do we, how many times do we do that? We make everything about us. We make everything about me. I mean, we live in, 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 our, in our world today, everything is so me-centered about making me happy, about what I want. You know, there are so, when you look around, there are so many options today. No matter what it is, it's all, and, and, and society tries to cater to that. Not only do they try to cater to that, they try to promote it. You know, telling you that it's all about you and that you just need to be happy with yourself. And this is, it, this is exactly what John is like saying, no, this, is, this isn't what it is. You guys are getting frustrated for the wrong reason. You don't make this about us. He says the Lord gives the increase. Everything we've experienced, all of these blessings he's telling them, as we've gone out and we've ministered and we've met so many different people and we've baptized so many different people for, for, you know, for the kingdom, God allowed us to do that. This was a gift from him. He allowed us to be a part of this ministry. And he says, you know, don't get confused. And John answered them, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given from heaven. Unless God has given it to you, you're not getting anything anyway. Y'all are worried about all these people that Jesus is baptizing and that we're not baptizing as many as we used to. And that's not even what it's about. It is about him. And you're trying to make it about you. Don't make this about us, he is saying. I, I, I think so many times in churches today, we get caught up in that. Think about that. I mean, I, 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 can, I easily get caught up in it. And I had to intentionally stop myself many times in the last three to four weeks from not having a similar attitude as the disciples of John the Baptist right here. As Sean explained to you, this past week, our church had an awesome opportunity to partner with the First Baptist Church of Van, seeing students from Van ISD come together in both churches, hearing the gospel, fellowshipping together, and these two churches working together. But don't get me wrong. There was a little bit of sometimes, there was a little bit of uncomfortableness. 
You could feel like, okay, when they're in our territory, you're in their territory. And, and, and sometimes it, there, it was there. And even building up to it, I think I even made a comment a couple of weeks ago. You know, hey, First Baptist Van's got this many kids and their people are helping recruit. Y'all need to get with it. That was the wrong thing to say. That was the same attitude that these disciples had. Would a, would, would a, a better wording of that would have been, hey, we're trying to gather students together to hear the gospel of Jesus. You probably should get them here. Because it wasn't about which church could have the most students. It wasn't about which church was, you know, go, going to have the better activities at, at their complex. It was about those students coming and hearing about the gospel for the first time in their life. But so many times we make it about a competition. So many times. And, and it's natural. It's, it's our, remember last week we were in 1 Peter chapter 5. And one of the things, it was all about having awareness. And the first thing I talked about was being self-aware. Being self-aware. I think it's in verse 6 right there in 1 Peter chapter 5. Right there in verse 6. And it talks about that you must humble yourselves. You must humble yourselves. And that's what, that's what John is saying. He's telling his disciples, it's not about us. I know, yes, it was really cool when we had all of these people and we're baptizing them and it took all of us. And yes, it was great. Those are great. But just because they've all moved on and more are going toward Jesus, that was the goal to begin with. It's not about you feeling good about yourself. It's not about you feeling proud that you got to do all this for the kingdom. It is that the kingdom is growing. And it doesn't matter if it grows here or there, as long as the true gospel is being, being preached, it doesn't matter. Right. And so we look at, as he, as he sort of sits them down, and he gets them to begin to understand that, hey, it's not about us. The next thing he sort of does is, he, he, he sort of says, you know what? And, and we don't need the spotlight. It's unnecessary for that spotlight to be on us. We are the spotlight. So many times, that's what we want is the spotlight. I think that, I, you know, I think one of, the, one of the problems today is, I believe, and we spoke about this at camp this past week. We talked about how um, some, when we look at the American church, it's on the decline. And I'm not talking about church and people coming to Jesus and following him. I'm talking about specifically the churches not teaching the gospel watered down Bible teaching, just trying to get people in the doors with whatever they can. And they're not teaching the word. And here's the deal. The, the problem with that is they want the spotlight, not on Jesus, but on them. And I think the next problem with that is people look and they see that people that get up on a stage and they preach or they speak or they teach or they they, they see people sing, and they want the spotlight on themselves. I'll be honest with you. One of the, one of the reasons, and, I, and some of you may not even know this, because most of you in this room right now weren't even here eight years ago when I showed up. And there's only very few of you that actually were. But when I first came, one of the things that we had were, and it was, it was more of a tradition, was we had special music. You know what I'm talking about? You have special music where somebody gets up and they sing a solo. Everybody sits down and listens to them. And after being here a little while, I remember going to the worship pastor at the time. And I said, listen, I don't think that's necessary anymore. And one of the reasons was, and one of the, one of the convictions that I had was, it was becoming a lot more about that person singing than it was about glorifying who Jesus is. It was, it was more about how, what they could do and less about him. I said, well, we are here to worship and corporately worship together. That right there is probably unnecessary. We ought to all be able to sing together and glorify him. And, and, and so if anybody ever looks back and goes, well, why did we get rid of those specials? That's why. Now, I do believe that there are right times that, yeah, we have little concerts and we do little things, you know, like that. But listen, the spotlight is not for us. Yeah, we are the light of the world. 
And, and, and we are to let our light shine. But usually when you have a light and you let it shine, it's to illuminate something for people to see. In a dark, dark world, we are to take our light and illuminate the love of Christ and who Jesus is. Not who we are, that I'm a good Christian and I follow Jesus. I might sing well or preach well. I might have half the Bible memorized. Look at me. No. And it's about look at who Jesus is. Look at what Jesus has done for you. The light goes to the cross. It should never go here. And that is what John is trying to explain as he's getting to that very important verse of I have to decrease, he must increase. It's not about me. Listen, the light, your light should continue to get brighter and brighter and brighter. Think about this. I was explaining a while ago how if you have a bright light and you shine it on somebody, they can't really see anything else but that light. If they're looking at that light, and if you take that light and you shine it over here or over here, they can look and see what you're shining it on. If they're focused on the light, which you are, they can't, they, they're so consumed by that light, they're not seeing the cross that you're supposed to be illuminating. They're, they're trying to look through you. And, and John is telling his disciples, listen, you yourselves are my witness, he says, he said in verse 28, I am not the Christ. The light doesn't go on me. It doesn't go on you. I am not the Christ. But I have been sent ahead of him. I've been sent ahead so that people will know. And I am pointing to who Jesus is. He, he said something similar in John chapter 1. If you flipped your page over and you went back to John chapter 1, he's John the Baptist is in front of the Pharisees and they say, now that, that he has been sent from the Pharisees in verse 24, they asked him and said to him, why are you baptizing if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? And John answered them saying, I baptize in water, but, but among you stands one. He takes that light and says, y'all are focusing on me. It's not about me. Among you stands one whom you do not know. It is he who comes after me. And the, th the, the thong of which sandal I am not worthy to untie. He said, you're missing it. You're focusing on me and the people I'm baptizing, but I'm trying to point you to the one and only Jesus. He is the one that you need to be focused on. I love what it says when I, when I look at that and it says, it's he who comes after me. And in verse 20, that was, that's what he said in, verse, in chapter one, verse 27. And in chapter three, verse 28, he says, I'm not the Christ, but have been sent ahead of him. And what it reminds me of, I love movies. I love uh, one of my favorite Disney's. And when they did the remake in the last couple of years was Aladdin. I love Aladdin. All right. All right. And, and do you remember when Aladdin comes marching into, into town? And they have that song, Prince Ali. I forget how it goes. That's not part of it. Uh, but he's marching into town. They have all, they have this giant parade. These giant animals, people with swords and fire and all this. And you think, look at that cool. But what they were doing and all that attention that was being brought as they march in is they're getting you ready for the one that's coming behind them, their king. They're, all of that is to get you ready and say, man, something big's coming. And you're not looking at the elephants anymore. You're not looking at the guys with swords that are juggling swords. You're looking for what's coming after them because whatever is coming after them is big. Whatever is behind them, that's what you want to see because the king is coming. And what John is telling his disciples right here is, I'm not the Christ, but I've been sent ahead of him. I'm marching ahead. I'm getting people ready because they have to see him. One of, the, one of the greatest examples I've seen of taking the spotlight off of himself and putting it on Jesus in the last just couple of days, just in the last couple of days, was by a player for the Orlando Magic named Jonathan Isaac. If you don't know this, I love, I love sports. I'm like, 
right now I'm sort of like just I can't wait. I need some sports. Give me some football, basketball, something. I've been trying to watch baseball, and it's really weird with these little cartoon characters behind the dug. I mean, it's just weird. And the same thing with basketball. Uh, I've tried to watch some basketball, and they have this automated crowd noise. But here this last week, they started up this new basketball season to get ready for the playoffs. Well, you not only have COVID, you're dealing with fake cartoon fans in the background, but now we have all this racial injustice and political stuff. And if you know me, I really don't mess, I, I, I'm not a, I don't preach political. That's just not my job. But I was paying attention to this, and as probably many people know, when you get to the NBA, NBA is probably 80% black men that play. And, and so this Black Lives Matter movement is obviously going to be really big in the NBA. Well, almost every single team, you know, before they get ever to the game, they're wearing these t-shirts that Black Lives Matter and they're promoting that. And almost every one of them, almost every one of them will kneel at the national anthem. This, this man, young, black man named Jonathan Isaac. I saw his picture on the internet the other day of him being the only one in his white Orlando Magic jersey with the number one on it, standing there with the rest of the men on his team surrounding him knelt down. And he stood out like a sore thumb. I mean, you have this six foot ten probably black man standing there and you're expecting him to kneel down with all the rest of his teammates, but he did. And immediately I'm thinking, man, there is going to be some fire come down on him. I mean, because they're going to come after him, and the first ones that are coming after him is going to be the media. So I said, I got to see what's happening, and so I end up, you know, I got I got to figure this out. And I, and I honestly, here's what I was expecting. I was expecting Jonathan Isaac, I was expecting him to get up there and say, listen, I'm a patriot, or my dad fought for, you know, my dad was a, a, a Vietnam veteran, or my dad fought in Iraq, and I just don't think, I, I was expecting this big patriotic speech, you know, about either what his dad did or what he's done. And I'm not, I'm not kneeling for them. So Jonathan Isaac gets up there. As they question him, all the cameras, you can imagine all the cameras come. I don't even know if he's even that good of a player. But I guarantee you, after that day, they're all there with everything focused on him. And they say, Do, this is the question, so you don't believe black lives matter? What? And his, the way he responded, obviously he responds, yes, black lives do matter. But that's not what I'm promoting. That's not why I stood. And so I'm like, oh, here it comes. Here it comes. And immediately he took the light and shined it somewhere else, exactly where it should have been. And he said, you know, the only problem in our world today isn't racism. We have all kinds of, we have all kinds of issues, social issues. We have health issues. We have poverty issues. But really the biggest problem is that people don't know who Jesus is. He said, I'm standing for the gospel of Jesus Christ. That people need to know that he died for their sins and that they need a savior. And I'm going, huh? I mean, I was, I'm like, I wasn't expecting this. And he turned the light and shined it on Jesus. And that's what John is telling his disciples. You're, you're making this way out to be more than it is. They should be baptizing more people than we are. You know, they, they, they should be doing that because our whole ministry is to point them to Jesus. And now that Jesus is baptizing more, we should be on fire. We should be excited. We should be full of joy. That, that should be who we are. We should be full of joy that somebody else is spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ because the spotlight should be on him we are the spotlight. Our job is to shine it on Him. And, and it should bring us joy. It should bring us joy if we hear 
First Baptist band has exploded. They've baptized 500 people just in the last two months. Their church has grown so much that it has to, you know, they're building a new one right now. We should be hooting and hollering and over there congratulating them and say, how can we help? Or some other church. It doesn't have, but I'm just saying, and, and what he's saying is it's about Jesus. It's about them promoting the gospel. It's about kingdom growth. And he, we should be happy about that. Paul, in prison, he, he writes to the Philippians. And in verse chapter 1, verse 15, he says, Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ, even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. Paul had gotten word that there were people that were legitimately sharing the gospel, that Jesus Christ died on the cross, that he rose again, that he's the son of God, that he has come to save the world from their sins. They are preaching the gospel. People are coming, but some of them are doing it from the wrong heart. Some of them are doing it for the wrong reasons. And he says, some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. In verse 16, he says, the latter do it out of love. I mean, that's how it should be done. We share the gospel out of love. He said, the latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. But the former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. So what he's saying is that there's people out there, there's sort of these preachers that have rose up and they realize that Apostle Paul is this great church planner. He started all of these churches. He's seen churches just grow and flourish. And so now that he's in prison, they're saying he can't do nothing. And so let's go out there. We can be better than Paul. Let's go out there and let's make a bigger church than Paul. Let's go out there and let's now baptize. He can't do anything. Let's go baptize more than Paul. Let's actually go out there and see if we can even get some of Paul's church people to come over since he's not there. He's in prison. That's what, that's what he's saying. And listen to what Paul says. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I will rejoice. He says, you know what? No matter what they're doing, they're telling the truth. They're giving the gospel, and the gospel is being proclaimed. And so only that in every way, whether in pretense or truth, Christ is proclaimed, in this I rejoice. They may be doing it out of spite and envy for me, but if those people are coming to know Jesus through that, praise Jesus. Amen. Praise Jesus. Now I want you to understand there's a big difference. They are preaching the true gospel. Because I hear people say sometimes, well, if you go on to church, and it doesn't really matter what church you go to. That's, that's just a lie straight from hell that Satan wants you to believe. It does matter what church you go to. It must be a Bible-believing, gospel-preaching church. Right. Now, it, it's got to be that. But regardless of what their traditions are or their building looks like or what their preacher wears, that doesn't really matter. And if they're preaching the gospel, we as followers of Jesus, no matter what church we ought to go to, we ought to rejoice that people are coming into the kingdom because the gospel is being shared. We don't need the spotlight. And why don't we need the spotlight? Because we are servants of the most high God. That's the last thing. He, we are servants. He says this. Verse 29, John's telling me. This is right before he gets to he must increase, but I must decrease. He says this in verse 29. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hear him, hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. He must increase and I must decrease. When he uses this illustration, and I, as we get ready to close, I want you to understand this because this last to me is, is, is the biggest point he was making to his disciples just in case they didn't understand. And he says, he is the bridegroom. He is pulling in and preparing his bride. He is calling his bride to him. And we were friends of the bridegroom, sort of like the best man or groomsmen. And what do best men and groomsmen, what is their responsibility? 
But you ask, you ask the bride, most of the time they'll tell you they ain't doing nothing. <laughs> but most of their, their job really is to support, to support the bridegroom, to support the bridegroom. If he needs something to help him, to make sure that things go smoothly, to make sure that everything works out for his bride. So when, when he is telling his disciples that we are friends of the bridegroom, they're beginning to understand that Jesus is the bridegroom. Throughout the New Testament, you hear that Jesus is the bridegroom and the church is the bride. But in the Old Testament, the Old Testament speaks of it as well. In fact, many times throughout the Old Testament, God is referred to as the husband of Israel. God is referred to as the husband. And he even chastises the Israelites and calls them harlots. Like they've gone out to other idols and they've cheated on their husband. Like they're adulterers. Not physical adulterers, but spiritual adulterers because they've left their husband to go out. So understanding when he called Jesus the bridegroom, to those Jewish followers at that point in time, he is pointing out that you are in the midst of God in the flesh. It's not... It's not just a great prophet. He's not just another prophet that's over there baptizing. It's not just another great preacher. He's saying that is God in the flesh. And because people are coming to him and being drawn to him, I rejoice and I'm full of joy and I'm so happy. When you go over and you look in Luke chapter 1, remember, <laughs> John's mother was carrying him in her stomach. And when Mary came and gave the news that she was carrying Jesus, John heard from the womb and began to jump up and dance. He began to move around and jump in her stomach. It tells us in Luke chapter 1. He rejoices in the fact that Jesus is king and his job is to just usher him in. I am your servant. And he's telling his disciples, get it. You're, you're, it's not about you. It's not about us. The spotlight, we are the spotlight to shine on the cross so people will know Jesus. We are his servants and we are to usher people to the cross, showing them who the bridegroom is. We are to usher the bride in. And we ought to find joy. We ought to find joy knowing that the kingdom of God is growing on the other side of town. And it's greater than what we're doing here. My question for you is, how is your attitude? That, that was the issue that the disciples were facing. They were facing some attitude issues. <clears throat> they were envious, prideful. And it was that that was going to hinder that ministry. And John says, we're stopping that right now. I want you, I want you to understand it's, it's those same kind of it's those same kind of attitudes that hurt the church today, that, that, that hinder the gospel from moving forward. Because we become a, a self-centered church. And I'm not just talking about this church. I'm just talking about the church in general. I'm talking about the American church that becomes so self-centered. You have to please me and everything ought to be about me. And Oh, if, these, if, this, if the church isn't comfortable, if it's not cool enough or it's not hot enough, if it's not warm enough, if they don't have enough for my kids, it becomes all of these things. It becomes about us, us, us. And if you're a Jesus follower, it's not about you. It's what John was telling them. It's about him. And if you've been saved, if you've been born again, if you know what it is to be forgiven and you've experienced the grace of of Jesus Christ, you're to take that spotlight and you're to shine it on the cross. You're to illuminate the cross saying, this, this is why, this is why I am who I am. This is where my light shines. This is who you need to know. Because you are a servant of the most high God, ushering in the bride to her groom. And my question is, how well are you doing? I think we can all, I, even me, I, we can all get to that point to where we need that pep talk from John. And he looks at all of us and he says, he must increase and we must decrease. 
the less it becomes about us, the more it becomes about Him. When it becomes hard, it becomes hard because a lot of times people don't know Him. You can't shine the spotlight on something that you don't really know that exists. And a lot of people like to play church. A lot of people like to just, you know, hey, pretend to be religious and don't have a relationship with Jesus. And right now what I want to do is I want to shine the spotlight on the cross for you. I hope that you realize today that Jesus Christ died for you on the cross so that your sins could be paid for and you could be forgiven. He rose again on day three, just like he said he would, to prove that he was God, to prove who he was to all of his doubters, and to fulfill prophecy so that we would know the Messiah has come. And he tells us that he is the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except by him. And if you're here today and you say, Pastor, I need him in my life, I would love nothing more than to introduce the bride to her groom. I would love nothing more than to show you how you can know Jesus. But if you're here today and you say, I do know him, then you're right. Like a lot of us, I've had the wrong attitude. And today I want to change it. We're going to give you that opportunity here in just a second. I'm going to ask the band to come up. I'm going to pray. And when we start to sing here in a little while, maybe you just want that opportunity to come and kneel down and, at, at the altar and just pray and ask God to forgive you. Maybe. Like me, I need forgiveness. I told you just a couple of weeks ago, I know I made a comment I shouldn't have. It was out of that same spirit that these disciples were making their comment. And we do that sometimes. It becomes more about us and less about Him. But the Scripture tells us that He must increase and in order for that to happen I must decrease maybe you're here today and you say I need him pastor I need to know him well, I want to encourage you to come find me you can come find me right here when I'm standing here singing or you can come find me in the back at the end but I'd love to talk to you and introduce you to the Jesus that I know and that saved me Heavenly Father God we love you Lord I'm so excited Father to get into this word Lord, as we get into this for the next couple of weeks, Lord, Lord, we all need this. We all need to realize that and become more kingdom focused. We need to take our, our light and, and continue to shine it and illuminate the cross instead of the things in our life. We need to realize it's not about us and that we are a servant of the most high God and we are here to serve. And God, I just ask right now, Lord, if there is somebody here that doesn't know you today, that's never experienced the grace that you offer, the forgiveness that you have laid out, but I pray today is the day of salvation to them. I pray that they won't leave here today without coming into that relationship with you. Lord, I just ask right now, Lord, to give that person the courage to maybe either stay back at the end or even come forward right now and say, I need to know Jesus. Lord, I pray for the rest of us that we'll begin to look and be self-aware of the things that are in our life that are hindering us from letting you increase. Because you should be increasing every day as we decrease. Lord, we thank you for this word today. Lord, may it change us. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand as we sing? Lord, I lay me down. Bring me up my soul.
myself, I belong to you. Oh, lead me, lead me to Oh uh-huh.